On this episode, an unlikely hero overcomes impossible odds and learns a valuable lesson. Welcome to Save Every Universe. My name is Alec Garcia, one of your co-hosts. I am a hardened survivor who's paid my dues, or a sex symbol with massive breasts due to an artist error, depending on which era of my career you look at. My name is Robbie. I'm a former Dark Knight and captain of the Red Wings who turned my back on the dark ways of the Baron, and now, as a paladin, must stop Zemus from using the crystals to destroy the world. Nice. Who were you last week? Uh, last week, I was Sephiroth. Good. From, That's a, yeah. yeah from, if seven. you missed it, we uh, covered villains, what makes a good video game villain last time, and I was Albert Wesker, specifically from Resident Evil Code Veronica, which I feel like is one of the kind of underrated installments of the Resident Evil series. Yeah, it was, uh, wasn't it the last one where it was kind of the top down? Because Resident Evil 4 switched, switched to, to more of the over the shoulder. Action. Yeah, but it was, uh, it was kind of a breakthrough game. It was on the Dreamcast yeah. and it was like hailed for having like the 128 bit graphics. And it yeah. was like, I remember looking at the magazine and being like, oh man, this is going to be amazing. Look how realistic it looks. And I think we, like, you played it, but I think I was at your house all the time while you played it. And yeah. I was like, oh, go check this out. And there was like the Golden Luger that you yeah, could unlock yeah. And it was one of the first ones that got a little bit over the because Resident Evil kind of went back to like did the over the shoulder a little bit more action driven but it did some of the first over the top stuff like where too much where like the harrier comes down and Wesker's like riding on top or something <laughs> like that there's yeah. like that, that over the top action stuff that they went really too far with in 5 and 6 in my opinion there was a bit of that in uh, in Code Veronica but Not overall enough, overall it was a really good game uh, anyway last uh, week um, Jimmy was yeah also. we had a special guest Jimmy who was who he? he was Reaper from Overwatch and so today we are talking about video game kind of in the same vein of like talking about character we talked about villains before uh, but talking about hero origin stories and some what are our favorite origin stories what are uh, some of the best ones in video game history and our opinions what have you on the docket today Rebby? as uh, as i was thinking about this episode i started in my head just naturally thinking about how even though I want to talk about our favorite origin stories, also how they've changed, I think, as video games have kind of grown up right. from the, you know, arcade Donkey Kong, Pong, or whatever, yeah. to today with, like, Last of Us and stuff like that. I think that's a great point, because now, if you said, what's your favorite origin story, or who's your favorite character, there's a lot of that that, through the lens of modern video games, wouldn't have been the same if you had this conversation in the 80s, 90s, or early, even the early 2000s. Right. Yeah, so things have changed a lot. So, if you want, I'll, I'll start with kind of my three eras that I've yeah I've please of do and, yeah give us sort of an outline to go this from. is just kind of something I thought up so I'm sure you there's some nuances to this and I've even thought of some counterpoints to it but just for the sake of conversation so I thought of it as kind of early years of arcade cabinet video games and NES because right. if you think of NES games there there are some exceptions to this of course but if you think of NES games even Zelda or uh, Metroid or mm-hmm. even some of the richer ones they're still just kind of like hey you're in this go blow some shit up right like, they're not really we don't we didn't we don't know Samus is a female. We don't right. know any of that stuff. It's right. very like alien game, go shoot. We're yeah. not like, I wonder what uh, motivates the centipede. <laughs> you know what <laughs> yeah. I mean? Why is I mean, Donkey even Kong? More, even like later cabinet, like arcade cabinet games like Carnival or Area 51 or even like the first Killer Instinct. Like there was characters and there was maybe a story if you wanted to go seek it right. out, but it wasn't, you, you didn't care. You didn't even ask that question. It was like it had good gameplay, it had good mechanics and it was fun and that was the end of it. But I will say, I was always excited about the little tidbits in like Mortal Kombat and being like, ooh, I wonder why Scorpion's here or what? what is it that like motivates these guys? Like yeah. I get so excited for that. You beat the game little cut scene with three paragraphs. I'm like, oh, this is huge. And that's actually, now that you're saying that, that's interesting because I think gamers started assuming more into the world, right? right. Um, I think the creators of the first, of Half-Life Valve, like when they made the first Half-Life, they talked about how they had grown up playing Doom and they were reading into that game more story than was actually there. And then they, they kind of realized that as a game development philosophy and sort of gave Gordon Freeman a little backstory, but you're left in the first Half-Life to assume quite a bit on your own. Right. And I think developers started to, to figure that out, that gamers wanted more and that they were projecting into games more than was there. And then so it, it kind of snowballed to where developers actually started creating that for the players. Right. And I don't think it's necessarily like a technology limitation, but it, it's just the trend. I mean, even if you think of, I know there are other RPGs in the NES era, but even if you think of like the first Final Fantasy, it's a little thin as far as like it's like you're the warriors of light go save the kingdom like it sounds a lot like uh destiny <laughs> <laughs> kind of right? right yeah but if you think of that versus like final fantasy 
VII yeah. or, or yeah. any I mean, of the lead, later like, games. Massive chasm between the two in terms of story quality and right. thought that went into those characters and that kind of thing. So then I think of the next era as kind of the 16-bit era or the Super Nintendo, Sega Master System, whatever. Right. Like kind of that era. And we started looking for more in the game. I mean, Mario gets a world that can be saved and yeah. you actually have like a save file. Um, a lot of the really cool JRPGs that Square was cranking out, like Chrono Trigger right. and Secret of Mana, those actually have like world origin stories right. and character origin stories. Right. Um, some more of one than the other. But, yeah. Um, and I, I th- yeah, we were talking a little bit before we started recording, but I, I tend to think of some of those like A Link to the Past and those as, as having sort of the world is more thought out, more goes into the backstory of like what led up to this cataclysmic event that you're now in the middle of, more so than as just a general statement. I'm sure there's exceptions, but as a general statement, more so than individual character origin stories. If you were to compare right. that to like Joel's origin story in The Last of Us, there it's more of a world thing. But that might be an RPG. That might be a a genre difference as well, though. It could be a genre difference, and even those are, as far as origin stories go for characters, it's a little thin. Now, I know that there are exceptions to this, too, right? Because there's point-and-click games at this point on PC. Um, there's text-based games, like on the old stuff, where it was just you typed in a command and right. stuff happened. Right. Those are obviously more richer in the story, but I feel like even those still don't have super rich origin stories. Right. So if we take my favorite game, Chrono Trigger, for example. Yeah. Like, Chrono, you're a teenager who wakes up, and it's time to go to the fair like mm-hmm. that's kind of it yeah and even though chrono trigger has great characters you don't really dig into his past much right you dig into a couple of the other characters past but as far as the main I, I, now that you brought that up though I, I do think that's an interesting game design technique it, uh, and i think that's where games mostly go to is that you sort of wake up and you're in this world and then you do some stuff and then the story sort of unravels as you go i think right. that's more common than like you see in movies or in books where you get laid out this origin story and this prologue type thing and then it leads to this story in a game it's like your master chief and you wake up out of out of cryogenic right. slumber now you go shoot some stuff and then you kind of find out what's going on as you go along uh, right yeah you know, i agree and i think that i think that even that depth if you compare that to like like what my my fake era before it or whatever the NES yeah, era before yeah. it it's still huge i mean that's right. a big deal i mean chrono trigger you're trying to save the world so it seems like the character origin stories especially like for the hero those don't get don't get a whole lot richer the world does and right. some of the side characters do too um and that includes mostly in my experience the jrpg games yeah but what about your um what's your the sh- Schneedle or the actually that's what I was Woodruff and the Schnibble yeah it was a point and click game and actually that's one of the things that came when you mentioned point and click games and having origin stories and that kind of thing that was one game that actually did have an origin story of the hero at the beginning of the game you sort of get a glimpse of who his father was and how he became who he is yep. and why he's doing what he's doing there was sort of an origin story there I think now I mean looking back on it that's probably I tend to gravitate towards story heavy games more so right. and uh, that's probably one of those reasons that I really liked it and they didn't belabor it it wasn't too exactly exhaustive or anything like that i think maybe it's like five ten minutes at the very beginning of the game but it, it's enough that you feel sympathetic toward the hero and you feel like you have a reason to go on this journey and solve these problems and want to get to the end of the game right yeah it's a lot more motivated i think still i would still so then i think the next era starts with like kind of the 3d era and i think i don't know why but because it's not like it necessarily looks better or it's not like you can't tell those stories which i'll talk about later with like indie games yeah. and stuff but but for some reason as we move into like the playstation era um, and on now to today, you see a much more in-depth character origin story. Right. I think maybe Final Fantasy VII is a great example of this. Mm-hmm. And I think I think VII is a great transition game that kind of moves from a rich world right. to like, we really want to hammer in this protagonist and make you go on his journey. Right. Maybe more so than games in the past mm-hmm. or, or at least, I, th- I think games in that era start doing that more. Right. Uh, we were talking about this a little bit before the episode, but I think... One of, the, one of the interesting storytelling mechanics in Final Fantasy VII is that as Cloud, you actually do flashbacks. Right. And you play through those flashbacks. Right. And even now, I, th- I think that's a great storytelling device. You see it in a little bit in Last of Us, I guess, if you count the opening scene. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, Nathan Drake does it in the Uncharted In Final game. Fantasy VII, though, they were well-placed. It wasn't yep. just like, now here's... It was like it made sense that like you were really invested in who, the, who you thought this character was. And then you get these right. flashbacks that totally disrupt 
and you sort of have that same feeling of betrayal almost like as cloud is discovering right. who he really is you sort of feel betrayed and shocked as well and you, you sort right. of feel what he's feeling they they use fl- i think flashbacks can be used poorly like yeah. they can be a lazy storytelling device but in final fantasy 7 it was they used it really really well to where right. well they took you back to those same moments yeah. and like put it in a new light and made you question it, which was right. profound, at least to me when I played it. Because yeah. I was like, no, I, okay, we've done the flashback. We get what happened. Yeah. But then you kept coming back and like questioning who was there. Yeah. And it was Zack and not Cloud. And you're like, what the hell is going on? And yeah. as, as Cloud's like slipping into madness, yeah. you're starting to be like, I don't even know who this is anymore. Right. And yeah, I think you're right. That was a great... It was a really good use of flashback right. as a storytelling device. And I think in general, that t- it seems like that that works better in games to get right into the mechanics and the action and the the reason you're there for the game and then let that story sort of unfold. Bioshock kind of did the same yeah, thing. There's a plane Bioshock's crash and you go in the lighthouse and then you sort of just get immersed into this world. And then slowly over time, um, you get these glimpses of what had happened before you had arrived there. So right. um, they didn't quite use flashbacks the same way, but you, you see these glimpses of the past sort of as you're going along and the consequences of all of that. Right. So I think we, in some, because now like where we're at now, even with just shooters like Titanfall 2, had, what a great story. And yeah. Didn't have a huge origin story, but it kind of does. You kind of play your pilot's origin story, right. where he's not even a full pilot yet. Yeah. You get thrown in, and you like are seeing his journey as a warrior, really. Yeah. And you you get glimpses of BT's background too, and you find out about like what yeah. he did with his. Captain BT before. was a great character. They did a great job of personalizing sort of wall yeah. style personalizing a robot or a uh, Tony Stark's AI, the Jarvis. Jarvis. Yeah, yeah, sort of giving it you feel like it's this person and this yeah. character. Yeah, I mean, by the end of the game, he's like your best friend. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, it's it's a really good example. So so I guess what I'm wondering is, if you look at all three eras like that, do you think heroes are better now? Do I think the heroes of video games are better? Right. Are they better written? Are they just richer? Or do you think that's unfair to say? Yeah, I don't know if there's like a, a better, because I, I mean, I was just thinking about that as you were talking, is I think there are times when it's better to leave sort of a void and to leave sort of a vacuum. And I think it's not lazy on the part of the developers um, when they do it well. They t- they put enough context around in the world and then just sort of let you be the hero. If they can do that skillfully, I think in some games that works really well and that's incredibly rewarding. I, d- I think it's a apples and oranges sort of thing though, because a game like The Last of Us or Uncharted, Naughty Dog does it so well. I don't have another example because they do it so they're I think yeah. they're kind of the standard in the industry right now well, they're, they're higher than the standard yeah because no one else meets it right you know what i mean but yeah, yeah they're definitely the high bar yeah exactly yeah they set the bar um but they do it, it's much more structured intentional storytelling mm-hmm. and that's really great too so i don't know if i don't know if one is better um than the other and i think you could probably come up with really brilliant um examples on on both sides do you have a thought on that oh well I don't know. I, I'm. I think it's interesting because, like, even indie games now. So I feel like we expect more depth from our origin stories of our heroes now. Right. And I've noticed, like, I was thinking about this for this episode. Like with indie games, it seems like we've almost we're almost the opposite of where we were with the cabinet arcade games, right? Because right. if you think of those as just purely mechanics based, and it was just a fun game like yeah. Donkey Kong, or whatever games like Inside or even Braid or any of these like rich indie games, mm-hmm. they are like bare. The mechanics are less about the gameplay and more about the richness of the character, right? And yeah. even in games like Unraveled... And the richness of the world, yeah. Right. Even games like Unraveled are telling kind of an origin story. Right. And like fleshing out who these characters yeah. are. And those are, yeah, they almost, a video game is almost kind of an excuse to just sort of tell a story and immerse you in an artistic exactly. world more than it is about the mechanics of the thing. Yeah. Right. Now it's like all about telling the story, which is crazy because so if you think about the way that a lot of these are played i mean they look really nice but mechanically they're not any more capable than mario right right and yet we've done so much more with it and we expect more with it Mm -hmm. why do you why do you think that is why do you think that it wasn't tackled as heavily or the culture didn't want it or whatever like elevating the mechanics along with not the mechanics necessarily but like why is it you can get a side-scrolling platform game yeah with a super rich story now yeah and we wouldn't have made that 20 years ago yeah i don't know that is a good question i mean like you 
you cite like Chrono Trigger all the time, and I yep. do think Link to the Past, even though it didn't do a lot of the origin story stuff that a lot of modern games are doing, because modern games are employing a lot of like the modern screenwriting technique type stuff, the hero's journey, and making games sort of match that structure, mm-hmm. sort of that tried and true storytelling structure. And maybe they didn't do that as much in the in the early days, but but they did put effort into uh, particularly RPGs, though, uh, like world creation, world development has always been part and parcel, I think, with the RPG genre. Like we've talked sure. about in a past episode, when table ga- it went from table games to... Right. Um, and those were always rich. And they're all about lore and storytelling and yep. characters and um, digging deeper and kind of being a nerd about the thing. Yeah. So so I think it was there, but it was more, I don't know what you'd call it, uh, compartmentalized into hmm. that particular genre, whereas a side-scroller, it was Mario and Fire and Save the Princess, and that was it. Right. You know? So I think it was there, but I think, I don't know, as nerddom has sort of gone mainstream, that desire for story and people who read and uh, and recognize good story like, want to see it in all these other genres as well. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I mean, and, and uh, I think... I think you have seen more crossover for it probably was more compartmentalized back then. And there is a lot more crossover of, I mean, cause I don't, I don't think back then, and I could be wrong, but I don't know if the tabletop gamers played video games, right? You know, I don't know if those worlds collided yeah. like they do now, right? you know, and it took games like Baldur's Gate or whatever, where those things started crossing over. That might be another exception to my, that's an old game, yeah. but that was a very rich piece. I mean, it was a PC game. Yeah. And I think most of the exceptions to what I'm saying are probably on PC, but well, and I guess you do see some of that clashing now even with destiny 2 there's people who say where did all the lore go and why is that not in the game and why is like the lore system and the card was it the cards or whatever the grimoire the grimoire cards, cards like yeah. why are those gone like all together now and there's people who really really want that that are like the hardcore people and then there's people who just want to pick it up and play casually and shoot and I, right so i don't know maybe those will always be a little bit at odds that who like the people who like there's people who have read Lord of the Rings, but then there's people who have really read Lord of the Rings and they've like looked into the elven language and uh-huh. they've done all this stuff. They're like the really hardcore yeah. Tolkien fans, right? Right, absolutely. Yeah. So I think there's probably a similar thing in gaming there. Yeah, I think that's that's probably a fair point. So what do you what do you think of the best? What what is it we look for in a in a hero? Because we talked about this a little bit with the villains. So what do you think of the best traits or what is it we want in a hero? So I, I think we've kind of skirted that a couple of times as we've been talking about a couple different things here. But I was I was looking into this and I was looking into um, I was looking at like some screenwriting articles about how, like, how to write a good origin story right. and like what goes into that. And I, I think there are some good points about that the, it has to be a flawed, underqualified or completely unqualified person thrown into an impossible circumstance that then overcomes. Like Peter Parker's a nerd and gets him, gets incredible powers and has to learn to be a hero, right? Yeah. Batman's a kid who sees his parents get killed. Like that, you immediately, you you bond with him, which is why I think the um, Tomb Raider reboot was so fantastic. In the original Tomb Raider, it was a big-breasted woman with some guns on her hips running around in a cave and like that was that, right? I thought that was very relatable to me. <laughs> As a teenage boy. Boy, I'm sure. a teenage yeah. boy. But they did such a good job with the reboot of like, she kind of had an adventure background, but she was way out of her depth and she gets thrown into this impossible situation. But the situation just sort of like crushes her and she has to overcome and she has to learn new skills and she has to become a survivor in her in her own right. right. I, I think that's the essence of an origin story is it's someone who's sort of weak and sort of out of place and in over their head and then they learn the things that they need to overcome. I think that's the essence of a of a good origin story. I think that's probably true. I mean, I don't, well, I don't disagree with you. I do think I can think of like exceptions though to that of heroes like, like Master Chief. Right. That dude barely said anything in the whole first game. And everyone's like, Master Chief's my boy. Yeah. Like he's my favorite. And even still today, I mean, finally in Halo 5, I guess. Well, but he was, he was little... like, like, uh, I think about Halo 2 and stuff. And like, there was the, I think it was Halo 2, the, like the bay doors open. It might've been three. I don't know. I got my Halos all mixed up, but like the bay doors open and he's going to like take this bomb to like blow up that thing and it everything about it feels like a suicide mission so i I think the more powerful the hero the more overwhelming and impossible the odds have to be and um, that's a good point actually and cortana and master chief sort of played off of each other where to the almost to the point where you you're not sure master chief would have been who he was without cortana he was she was his better half sort of and so there was a little bit of he's he's all brains and or all brawn and muscle and guns yeah and she was the brains and the plan and the 
charm and the yeah well, that's a great point actually and you know like the very end of mass effect 2 commander shepherd is mm-hmm. still one of my favorite heroes but it's weird to think of because you kind of develop his story like right. my commander shepherd is going to be a lot different than somebody else's right. you even pick their origin story you have to choose between three incidents that shaped him right in mass effect one yeah before you even like when you're creating the character but but i'm sure those are sort of i haven't played it but i'm sure those were sort of like mapped out to be where it's like one of those choices at least was like something that made you sympathetic to him like yeah well and most people chose one of yeah, yeah one of the i think there was like a sole survivor okay incident where you were like the only survivor of your squad being wiped out right and sure sure enough i think most people chose that but anyway like by the end of mass effect 2 you're really powerful you've done all this crazy shit yeah but the last mission is a suicide mission yeah it's called suicide Suicide mission. Yeah. They like make no, you know, All right. no beef about it. So, I mean, I think that's a, a really good point. So, I feel like there's like an anti villain rise thing in, in everything. The mm-hmm. Dead- and I like Deadpool, so don't get me wrong, but yeah. the Deadpool anti hero. Right. Uh, sorry, I said anti villain. I yeah, mean, anti hero. Yeah. Do you think that's infected video games? The way it's kind of infected like TV and books and movies and stuff? Yeah, where he's, it's sort of a bad guy who learns to do yeah. good he's like, things, kind I mean, of. Or... Joel is kind of like that, right? Yeah, that's, uh, that was my thinking. Um, but even, even if you take Deadpool as an example, example he they did such a freaking good job in that movie of like he was a guy desperately in love who gets a horrible disease immediately yeah. like even though he get, he's like invincible and he's foul mouthed and all this other stuff it's like they did the right thing at the beginning by making him relatable and that kind yeah. of stuff so i think even if yeah i do think probably there is a sort of an ant i don't know anti-heroes have been around for like a long time no, though and sort no, of the- no doubt i i guess i'm just asking because i feel like it's kind of blown up like everybody's a yeah. damn anti-hero everyone wants to be like a batman dark brooding I, I think probably like things are fresh and cool and then o- over time right they get used and used yeah. and used and then they'll, they'll probably go away but i think I think probably it's fair to say that people got tired of the, um, and we've talked about this in the past with our, our racism and sexism stuff that's going on in the industry. Like Horizon Zero Dawn was like a great example of like a really fresh new thing where like a female protagonist or the Tomb Raider reboot, the female protagonist was done really well and taken very seriously and it was awesome. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it totally changed like how people thought about female characters in gaming. So, but I think, I think anti heroes is one of those things where it's, it's going to be cool for a while and then it's just going to sort of, yeah, I actually, out. I actually feel like the reason I brought it up is because I feel like it's a, it's in a lot of other mediums, but I actually feel like it hasn't infected video games as yeah. bad as it has in okay. other mediums. Because I yeah. feel like most heroes are pretty. I mean, Joel is kind of an anti-hero, but yeah. Nathan Drake is not. Right, he's like he's a, a classic, upbeat yeah. classic. Like, let's go get him. Yeah, and I feel like that's still even though we've like gotten darker and grittier and yeah. stuff, and sometimes more depressing with our heroes. Yeah, I think in the video game medium, we've still there's a little bit more of that classic good guy. Sort yeah, of thing. I yeah. don't feel like the anti-hero has infected video games the way it has maybe other mediums but i was curious yeah. what you think just because well, yeah no I, I i i think that's a fair point i guess i hadn't thought about it too much beforehand i mean when i think about like sam drake being introduced like he's probably more he's, of like yeah. that if he, if he was like a star of the game he's sort of like on that line where he's like he's kind of a good friend to some people some of the time but he's yeah. really out to he would be a good butt. example and, of so, yeah if he was the star he would be sort of an anti-hero but yeah that's i think that's probably true i think there there is not quite as much of that in there yeah yeah, I'm not sure why that is. So much, I, I don't know if it's... My only thought is maybe it's harder to relate to that or to play as that character. Maybe it would get tiring after Well, we a talked while. about it with The Last of Us, too. Like, they, they allude very quickly to Joel's after his daughter dies and both and then before you started playing them, like there's a, there's years that happens between there that you don't know what happened, but you get these little hints that he did some really, really bad dark yeah. stuff. Um, and I think it was wise on Naughty Dog's part to leave that out. So it's like, it gets implied so that he, you know, this dude is a, like a badass and will do whatever it takes. Mm-hmm. But I think if they would have revealed too much of it, it would, he would have been like a villain. He would have been a villain. He would have been unrelatable. He would have been a monster. So yeah, I, th- I think there's probably not as much of it. Cause in most situations, I don't know how many people want to be that bad. Now that Jimmy's not on our, right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, Jimmy, yeah, that's about our time. Uh, do you have any final thoughts on origin stories, characters, story and video games in general? I guess we kind of covered a lot of ground here. Yeah, we did. Um, I, I love, I do love origin stories, but I'm, I'm the kind of guy who kind of like wants to learn the character and then move on. Yeah. I really like seeing the next, next part so like all these movie reboots of origin stories yeah. and games like i don't know i like to move on i like to see so now we've established this as their hero i want to see them like do good or mm-hmm. like take on the next thing so and i think 
I think overall, I, I tend to agree with you. I, I want the origin story, though. But I think the the games I'm most impressed with, and we didn't get too deep into this, but one of them was Firewatch. And they did a really nice job at the beginning. There's a They do a cool sequence there where you immediately get all of his backstory. You immediately feel really deep. Like, it almost, I almost started crying playing through this, uh-huh. this opening thing. It was so freaking good. But it was quick. And then you get into the game and you start playing. So I think games that do origin stories really well just do those little well-placed pops that yeah. do enough bond but they let you get back to playing the game and doing the next thing and discovering the next the next step of the story. Thank you for listening to Save Every Universe. If you enjoyed this episode, please go listen to all of our other episodes and give us money at patreon.com forward slash save every universe. <laughs> <laughs>